good afternoon from Stockholm. I would like to begin by acknowledging that I'm speaking to you today from the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabeg people. The Algonquin peoples have lived on this land since time immemorial. My name is Tom Cormier, and I'm proud to lead the Parliamentary Centre. The Centre, since 1968, has been supporting more effective and inclusive governance in Canada and in over 70 countries worldwide. I'm very pleased to collaborate with International IDEA on this discussion today. Uh, I had the privilege of working for IDEA for three years in Myanmar, where I opened their first office, so it's near and dear to my heart. I'm particularly grateful for Secretary General Kevin Casazamora for his leadership on the Defend Democracy campaign, which has brought together an impressive number of organizations and leaders from around the world to highlight the need for us to think about democracy and its importance during this really difficult time that we're all going through together. I'm excited to have this discussion today with so many distinguished individuals who among them have a depth of experience in democratic governance, uh, foreign policy, academia, and it's truly remarkable. Um, and the audience is equally impressive, a mix of democracy practitioners, academics, foreign affairs and development professionals, all looking for sage advice from our panelists on options uh, to react during this time. Housekeeping. Just first off, um, we have a panel of uh, five amazing resources, uh, and I want to make sure we can hear from all of them. So I encourage crisp answers from our panelists of two minutes each so that everyone gets a chance to share their thoughts. And I will remind you that I do retain the power of intervention. Uh, and uh, to the audience, questions are highly, highly recommended. We want to draw from the knowledge, experience, and insights of our panelists. So please do so via the Q&A function. And where possible, please direct your question to a panelist to, to, make it, uh, to make sure you get the answer you're seeking. And I'll do my best to incorporate those in the discussion. Now to our esteemed panelists. At the age of 19 years, Elena Panchulidze found herself in student organized protests in Tbilisi, Georgia, sparked by video footage that showed prison guards abusing inmates. As a result of these protests, Georgia's interior minister stepped down and President Saakashvili suspended the entire country's prison staff. Elena, Eleni writes on democracy development and cooperation, peace mediation and protracted conflicts from the College of Europe in Bruges, where she works, and I think it is today, and for the Georgian Institute of Politics, where she's a policy analyst. She is co-author of Global Democracy and COVID-19, Upgrading International Support, a paper that the Parliamentary Centre was pleased to review and endorse. Uh, and it's a must read for anyone looking to support democratic institutions and actors in these unprecedented times. We'll send a link to the paper in the chat if you haven't already received it. Um, as a youngster in Costa Rica, Kevin Casazamora voted for the first time at the tender age of five. He cast his ballot to elect the president of his first grade class. This takes place in classrooms all over the country to socialize democratic norms from an early age, and clearly it worked. Kevin went on to become Costa Rica's second vice president, minister of national planning, secretary for political affairs of the Organization of American States, senior fellow at the Brookings Institution and national coordinator of the UNDP's Human Development Report. He has written extensively on campaign finance, elections, democratization, security and civil military relations, and he now serves as Secretary General of IDEA, where Canada has been a member state since 1997. In the historic P Pearson Diefenbaker election of 1962, a young Colin Robertson accompanied his mother as a scrutineer for Margaret Conance, a candidate in Winnipeg South. In the election just a year later, he licked envelopes and put stamps on campaign material with his grandmother, who was an activist working with the Manitoba Farmers Union. During a very accomplished diplomatic career, Colin represented Canada in Washington, Los Angeles, Hong Kong, and in New York at the UN. And he is, in, in, through his career, was instrumental in, in the Canada Free Trade Agreement and, and the North American Free Trade Agreement negotiations. Colin Robertson is Vice President and Fellow of the Canadian Global Affairs Institute and writes extensively on foreign affairs for leading publications. Kevin DeVoe learned how to canvas for votes when he was five years old. Father was a candidate for local council in Coal Harbour, Nova Scotia. His charm made the difference and his father won. In 1989, Kevin went on to win a seat in the Nova Scotia legislature and was re-elected in 1999, 2003 and 2006. Since 2001, Kevin has been working internationally to strengthen parliaments and democratic institutions. He's worked in over 50 parliaments and with MPs from more than 110 countries with the UNDP, International IDEA, NDI and the works. He now leads DeVoe International Consultants providing technical assistance to parliaments, political parties, and organizations that work with these political institutions globally. Um, we will have with us joining shortly Anita, Anita Vandenbell, 
who had a very special guest in her uh, constituency this morning. Uh, the Prime Minister was dropping in for a visit, so she let us know that she would be a little late, but she's very committed to joining us, so she will do so shortly. And Nita has worked in over 20 countries on inclusive governance and women's leadership since 2015. She's been a member of Parliament for Ottawa West Nepean and now serves as Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of National Defence. She's also a member of the Special Committee on COVID-19 Pandemic uh, for the Parliament uh, in, in the hybrid form. And she's also uh, a, a former board member of the Parliamentary Centre and Maine's a passionate advocate for democratic development. So I would like to, uh, I would like to start with Eleni. Um, and uh, I would like to ask, thinking about the policy paper that you co-authored, um, that was looking at challenges to democracy and the importance of international support, what key democratic governance areas did you find were most threatened in this current crisis? But Tom, thank you very much uh, for the introduction and uh, thanks to ID International and Parliamentary Center for organizing this event and uh, invitation. It's an uh, honor to be part of this panel. And uh, indeed, you have already mentioned that uh, this uh, policy report um, that was uh, commissioned and funded by the European Endowment for Democracy was a great opportunity to bring together the leading experts um, uh, from major democracy organizations, including the Parliamentary Center and ID International to work together uh, and uh, to uh, rethink uh, what are the major challenges uh, of um, uh, democracy's challenging uh, faces today and not only reflect on what are the um, areas uh, of concern but also think about what could be solutions and uh, provide also suggestions and guidance to uh, the major international organizations governments uh, and um, the people who are concerned by democracy including the civil society organizations or activists um, across the world. Uh, indeed, the, um, uh, the major areas uh, we have covered and we have analyzed um, many areas that we are, have been concerned uh, with the uh, pandemic and uh, this um, altered context uh, that uh, a pandemic has provided uh, really changed uh, the context and also the measures that were uh, sometimes necessary and justified and also constitutional uh, really provided an, uh, an opportunity to different governments uh, to intervene and uh, to use some uh, how uh, democratic um, uh, uh, limitations. Uh, but the most important thing for us was uh, to uh, look into the way, uh, look into and analyze whether this uh, kind of interventions, um, uh, the in implementation of lockdowns or the, the measures that were implemented by the government, how they were um, uh, aligning with the democracy norms and standards that are valued by, uh, that are valued internationally. And uh, when speaking about the uh, governance, uh, um, uh, governance dimensions so what you have already mentioned we have seen that um, in many countries uh, due to the COVID-19 pandemic uh, there have been the, uh, the, the delay uh, of uh, of the of the elections and over in the, over the uh, 100 countries across the world the elections have been delayed and uh, we see that uh, this kind of uh, in, uh, institu uh, institutional processes that are important for each countries uh, has provided um, uh, the challenges uh, to various countries and this has been the challenge not for the governments and uh, specific countries across the world but also the uh, international organizations which work on the elections to provide the election monitoring and and uh, also to help them uh, to see uh, that the, uh, the elections are uh, provided and uh, implemented with the um, uh, with the democratic within the democratic standards. And what we have seen also is that um, uh, under the COVID nineteen pandemic, we have seen that in a lot of countries it was not possible to have this um, like checks and balances working um, uh, as in traditional situations. Not only in uh, um, uh, in, in different countries, for example autocracies and I want to specifically note here that uh, within our report uh, even though we provide different examples of uh, many countries both within democracies and uh, autocracies uh, it was not our aim to assess how different countries have performed but to see whether uh, what have been the distinctive outcomes of the COVID-19 pandemic on the democratic processes and we have seen that it was not possible to have this um, traditional checks and balances mechanism working because of uh, uh, the 
address uh, the different uh, and uh, altered context um, of the pandemic. And uh, th there was also the limitations of the uh, public inclusion uh, and participation in the decision making process, which is a major democracy uh, standard. And when we were looking into uh, solutions and suggestions uh, for the, the, the democracy support organizations, this was one of the areas where we uh, suggested to focus that uh, all um, the public inclusion and inclusiveness in the process um, of uh, political performance should be encouraged uh, and um, uh, promoted by the um, uh, democracy support organizations. And uh, Can I get you just to wrap up quickly? Uh, yes, uh, and uh, uh, two major areas I wanted to mention was uh, certainly uh, the, uh, the the corruption cases uh, and also um, uh, this dimension is uh, should be um, uh, should be explored by international organizations and measures should be undertaken to uh, to help the governments uh, and also organizations working um, uh, locally um, uh, in, in different countries uh, to men uh, to have uh, the tools for the oversight to the public. Mm -hmm document cases happening during the pandemic. Thank you, Elena. And I'd like to welcome uh, Anita. We mentioned uh, the reason for your delay, and it, it is very much understood, but I welcome you heartily to the discussion. Um, and uh, I would like to flip over to you if I can. Um, Elena mentioned the challenges of oversight, and I know that you sit on the special committee, uh, the COVID-19 committee, which is was designed for the hybrid parliament to have an effective check on government during this unprecedented time. But you also have been a participant in this parliamentary rapid response team, uh, which brings together legislators from a number of different countries. Can you let us know some of your reflections on how parliaments are adapting to these challenges um, by ensuring effective oversight at a time of unprecedented government spending in many places? Well, I, I think that um, in some ways it's actually uh, really enhanced the representative role of Parliament. Um, early on in the pandemic, we started doing daily phone calls uh, with all members of Parliament, and it was it was rapidly things were changing so quickly. Programs were being rolled out so quickly, and government's capacity to be able to respond to the public uh, and do the kind of analysis and stakeholder outreach that they normally would do was completely at a minimum. So it was really members of parliament that were the, the entry point for most Canadians into government. And we, instead of programs that would normally have taken two, three years of all kinds of policy analysis and outreach and planning, we were putting out programs and then relying on members of parliament to bring bring the feedback to see what's working, what's not working, what needs to be changed. Uh, I've never seen government move so rapidly. And those calls, I sometimes wish, and, and I think it's because the media wasn't on those calls, I, I sometimes wish the public could see that because all parties, all members of parliament were on these daily calls with officials and advocating on things that really, the, where the gaps were. And it was changing. Sometimes I would raise something and the very next day, I would say. Yeah. So go ahead. Go ahead. No, please continue. Um, I think the representative role, of course, has, has been enhanced. The, the legislative role of members of parliaments is a, is a little bit more difficult, um, obviously, because of the, the being physically in the House of Commons uh, has been so much more difficult. Um, although we did pass a lot of pieces of legislation, we, we did that more by uh, going back and forth through the leadership of the different parties. So the role of individual MPs where we would normally be doing legislation uh, review through committee and hearing from witnesses, not as much. Um, I, I hope that we will be able to do a lot more of that in the coming session. Um, and uh, as far as the oversight role, I think this part, because of the way that question period was done, uh, I've had a number of members of the opposition also saying that um, the question period was actually better. Uh, there was a back and forth, um, there was an ability to question ministers directly uh, every single day. And so I think in that sense, um, we may want to actually take some of the, the examples of how that, that COVID committee was able to do that question and answer session and okay. continue. Yeah, and any thoughts on your international engagements um, in linking up with members of parliament from very different uh, uh, from very different countries from around the world? What were some of the challenges that you found in common, but really other challenges that you think really do require international uh, support? 
Um, well, I've always believed legislators, we elected people are the front line of democracy. And we know that authoritarian uh, anti-democratic forces are working together globally, but legislators are not. And for a long time, I've been, because of my previous experience before politics, trying to build uh, networks where we can connect MPs, parliamentarians from around the world. Um, it's actually been a lot easier because of COVID. Before I would be asked, can you go to Kenya and do a women's workshop with the uh, candidates or can you fly to Haiti to do something? And of course, travel when you're an MP is really difficult. Now it's things like this. It's, yeah. uh, it's Zoom calls and I've done more international work since <laughs> Uh, you know, 7 a.m. I'll be on a, a Zoom call with yep. members of parliament from from Singapore to Ecuador and everything in between. Um, and I'm finding it's actually easier to work globally, uh, maybe because of the the cyberspace. Those geographic boundaries are disappearing. Uh, we did create the Parliamentarian Rapid Response Team, and this is through the Parliamentarians for Global Action. Mm -hmm. uh, very much this notion that when a legislature is in a backslide, uh, when there's an attack on a parliament or a parliamentarian. It's really yeah. parliamentarians and parliaments that have the voice to be able yeah. to speak out. And we've been working uh, very well actually with Zoom calls and WhatsApp. Um, being able to just connect with other MPs from around the world through WhatsApp is, it's the technology is there, it's simple, it's quick. Uh, it doesn't take any real upfront money, but it's, uh, it's very effective. I'm um, working right now on trying to establish a global network of women parliamentarians in defense portfolios. There's currently oh, so uh, working with a, um, an EU member of parliament from Germany uh, to get that going. So we've been able in some ways because of COVID, I think to do more when it comes to the international mobilization uh, across different countries. Um, and, and then of course the in-person sittings in our own parliament is, is more limited. Indeed. Thank you, Kevin. Casa Zamora. Um, ID and others have forcefully advocated for the need to defend democracy um, and have called on policymakers to continue support for democracy building efforts. How can decision makers, in your opinion, coordinate these efforts and what should they be doing collectively to prepare ourselves not only to respond for, for this particular moment, but to prepare ourselves for the future moments to come? Well, thank you so much, uh, Tom. And it's a it's a real pleasure to for for me personally and for International Idea to partner up with the Parliamentary Center. Uh, I didn't know, by the way, that you had a uh, that idea was in your past. Uh, you, you see, this is the this is like the rock song that you know a, a, you can check in anytime you want, but you can never leave idea. <laughs> so. I mean, it is great to be to be here and, and to share this panel with uh, such distinguished speakers. Uh, look, um, I think there are several there are several things that that need to happen if we want to be effective in defending democracy in the current context. I mean, the the, the first thing is that we have to realize that we cannot this that we cannot do this alone. That we cannot go it alone. I mean, the, the, the crucial task, given the magnitude of the of the challenges that we were facing, challenges many of which were there that were there before the pandemic struck, but that the pandemic has brought more salience to. Um, it, given the magnitude of those challenges, I mean, we have to realize that we cannot go it alone. Um, number one, and that the the that the, the truly crucial uh, task at hand is that we that we build that we weave together a, a, a sort of protective network for democracy, which is a, a global protective network for for democracy. It, second thing, we have to realize that this uh, that we're in for a twilight struggle. That this is uh, uh, this is not only about this time and place. I mean, this will go on for a long time. Uh, and and here, you know, one of my main concerns is that the, you know, and I've been thinking a lot about this. I mean, this is Ideas' twenty fifth anniversary, so it's a it's, it's a good time 
to, to look back and think a little bit about the differences between this time and the time when IDEA was created 25 years ago. It was a time of global optimism about democracy. You know, everybody was upbeat about the prospects for democracy. Well, not anymore. And part of the reason why we are not so optimist uh, uh, right now is that the, the international incentives for democracy, the international context has changed dramatically. So the headwinds uh, that we are facing in this task of spreading the democratic creed are much stronger than, than they were. I mean, we're going to be at this for a long, long time. And, and in practice, what this means is that, you know, what we're trying to do with the, with the, with the call to defend democracy. I mean, you have, if you, if you believe that we need a global protective network, I mean, you have to talk the talk and walk the walk. Yeah. You have to grab the phone and start calling people uh, uh, just as, you know, uh, uh, we, we got on the phone at some point, uh, the two of us. And and start doing things together. Start doing you know projects together. Start doing statements together. Start working more closely, rather than competing for an ever dwindling pool of resources. Exactly. And and I guess you know in a in a in a more a substantive vein, you know, if we want to be effective about protecting democracy and about a, you know protecting democracy not just now but also for the next crisis it, there are a few things that are essential we need to protect in particular press freedom mm -hmm. we need to protect civic spaces for ci for civil society to make its voice heard we need to protect the capacity of democracies to celebrate, to, to, to hold uh, adequate elections. And all, all those things are important in their own right, but they are also functional to protecting democracy and preventing this kind of calamity from happening again. I mean, there's a, and, and with this, I, I I, I, I finish, you know, there's, there's this long-standing discussion uh, around the question that uh, fam the famous economist, Nobel laureate Amartya Sen posed a long time ago, that why is it that there are no famines in democracies? Well, it, it has to do with the fact that democracies allow for the free flow of information mm. and democracies allow for collective action that is able to correct a public policy so they are better in terms of preventing famines and they are better in terms of preventing pandemics and they are better in terms of preventing preventable calamities exactly. so we need to be particularly focused right now it, not just for the sake of this pandemic, for, for the sake of the next one. Yeah. We need to be focusing on protecting press freedom, on protecting civic spaces, and on protecting the capacity of countries to celebrate adequate, uh, adequate elections, which very often are the only safety vault that uh, political systems have in times of great stress. So I would say that. Okay, thank you. Um, Colin Robertson, you wrote recently that the G7 should consider bringing in India, Indonesia, Korea, and Australia. And I'd appreciate your thoughts on why deepening ties between democracies is crucial in a time of COVID. And also to ask the question, are we due for a shakeup in the international world order because of the uh, totality of this challenge? Well, thanks, Tom. To answer your, your last half of your question, yes, I think we are at the COVID moment. And just as uh, events in the past have shifted the international order, I think uh, COVID is having that effect. It is a global international health crisis, which has caused an economic and financial crisis, and it's accentuating some of the other challenges we're going to deal with climate, migration, uh, and as been mentioned, 
dealing with the rise of authoritarianism and the rise of China. Uh, so if we can deal with the international health crisis and six months on, I think the verdict is still in the, in the balance, as Antonio Guterres said, you know, this is a real test of yeah. the multilateral system. And by his standard, we're not doing very well. Uh, the, and the democracies, you know, yes, I certainly agree with democracies are the best form of government, but it doesn't appear to me that if you look at the two of the biggest, the United States, for example, in India, they, uh, Brazil, semi-authoritarianism, but democracy, we're, we're not doing as well. The some are doing well. I think we could look uh, to uh, uh, Taiwan and Korea and New Zealand, but these tend to be sort of small, and they've managed it. So I think that's been a challenge. Um, I I look at Canada. I think that uh, you know again. I, I I think we we we've made best efforts, but as a federation, you go across the country, we've got different different approaches. What we're lacking, and I see the same thing in the European Union, they haven't got their act together, and certainly, as I said, the United States doesn't. So globally, the, the democracies who should be acting together are not, and we've tended to deal with this global pandemic on a kind of national and subnational level. And uh, what when we need, in fact, because this is a transnational crisis, that the, we shut our borders, but that's not going to succeed for long. We, we should be dealing with this in an international basis. And while I'm heartened when Anita says she's talking to counterparts, that's important, but I don't see the plan. And certainly if you look at the UN and you look at how the EU and we haven't got at a time when we should have an international health strategy and we created institutions like the World Health Organization to do so, we're not there. Yes, mm -hmm. the World Health Organization needs reform, but uh, can deal with that at a later date, but in the meantime, we should be it should be working better than it is. So uh, maybe I'll stop there. Thank you, thank you very much, Colin. I see we've got Kevin back. We uh, had some technical difficulties, but I'm very glad you've been able to join us with video this time as well. If I can ask you, Kevin, you are a real watcher of uh, of parliaments in every corner of the world, and I see that on my Twitter feed and and my LinkedIn feed every day. What are you seeing as uh, both worrying trends, but also trends that really uh, are hopeful? And what can Canada do to be supportive of those things that are going right, but also uh, intervening in those things that are, that are not going right as regards to parliaments and their ability to adapt to this and be uh, a force for good during this pandemic? Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to speak. Um, uh, look, I think that um, with regard to parliaments globally, um, I think to me what we've seen, uh, is following up on what Colin was noting, some of the countries perhaps that have been more challenged by COVID, some of the issue I think is trust. Trust in parliament, trust in government, if I can writ large, trust in uh, independent institutions. I think where those are robust, where there is a level of trust, where there is an understanding between political parties, I think there's been more success in maintaining democracy, but also in fighting COVID. Uh, and those two things I think are interlinked. Um, one of the uh, factors I think that affects parliaments, and I'll use Canada as an example, but I could probably use others as well, is where you have um, electoral systems that promote uh, no majority party, uh, European model, maybe most importantly, but in Canada, we see where, where we've had minority or hung parliaments in the, in, during this crisis, uh, we've seen more collaboration. We've seen more time in parliament, uh, and where we've had majority governments, we've seen less. Um, honestly, if this was a majority parliament right now in Ottawa, I'm not sure we would have had the exact same rollout of oversight and committees that we have seen but uh, we have and i i would i would say that's because of the minority parliament so electoral systems have i think a lot to do with accountability in general and particularly during a crisis so uh i mean on the plus side i think that um as i say that trust issue is there and one that we need to build on um i think the look internationally one of the things that parliaments, I think, was that you saw very quickly were the parliaments that were able to adjust to virtual uh, online engagement. Um, some had already been doing that. I know that I appeared before the Foreign Affairs Committee in Ottawa 
uh, a year and a half ago. I was in Bangkok and there was video conferencing already available. So I think I, that is a good thing. And I think Anita was pointing that out as well. The representation, the engagement, I think will expand. I think it needs to expand further. I think there needs to be some discussions about how there is more online dialogue uh, but where the parliaments have been able to make that shift, particularly to committees, where you had committees that had staff, that had resources, that had access to technology, you saw the ability for them to move quickly um, to, you know, we all know that, well, most should know, committees are the workhorses of the parliament. They're the ones that do the detailed work. If you can get them functioning, and that's what I saw a lot of parliaments able to do uh, re relatively quickly in a virtual manner, it made a big difference in the ability for people to see that parliament was still a part of that discussion. Where we haven't seen that or where the trust issue is is more prevalent um i think those are where we've seen that breakdown perhaps and that's where people are beginning to question if i can just say one i know there'll be other opportunities to speak but just to say i actually am not so uh, skeptical not so negative about the impact of covid i actually think i look back to 1918 1919 and it was a serious time but it was a time that people moved on from and i understand this is a crisis and one that we need to be serious about but I suspect in the long term, there won't be those major upheavals or shifts that people are sometimes talking about. And I think that there will be a tendency to want to go move back to somewhat to normal, whatever that is. And I think a lot of that will also play out in democracy as well. Okay. Thank you, Kevin. Um, a question for Lena. In your paper, you looked at some of the challenges of particularly facing women, marginalized groups, the LGBT community pushback that we've seen increase during this time. Any advice to policymakers on how they can address these things by providing direct support or providing support to parliaments uh, to better and engage its communities to try Indeed, uh, thank you for the question, Tom. Uh, this was one of the areas we have looked into, uh, which groups have been uh, specifically affected by the pandemic. And uh, indeed, as you have already mentioned, uh, uh, women uh, were one of the marginalized groups uh, which were, um, uh, who were heavily affected by the pandemic. And we have witnessed uh, during the pandemic, uh, because of the lockdowns and mandatory stay at home, we have witnessed uh, that uh, the domestic violence violence rates have raised uh, dramatically in a lot of countries across the, uh, the world, both uh, in, also in European countries, which was uh, very dramatic to see. Um, and uh, there was also a dramatic rise in the calls, uh, in the emails, uh, ask for the shelter on, uh, from, uh, from the side of the woman. And uh, when, when it comes to uh, considering what could be um, the solutions, and just to add a small that um, besides the fact that the, there have been uh, dramatic issue of uh, facing in terms of violence, women at home also uh, undertake a lot of roles and it is also very difficult to uh, manage working together with the social roles women are having at home. So there have been a lot of gender gaps and issues uh, women were facing during the uh, pandemic. And when, when we are talking about what could be the solution and how policymakers uh, should address the issues, I would, uh, I would personally suggest to first of all have um, the local understanding of uh, the uh, policy issues. And when it comes to the solutions, uh, there is always necessary to have the engagement of women when coming uh, to, to tailor made the solutions. Uh, and uh, the, the local context for sure, because it differs per country uh, to country, then they uh, certainly the engagement of women because they know the best, uh, the context of the challenges and that they could provide the best uh, guidance, uh, uh, guidance for the solutions. And the third one, is that a lot of international cooperation happens uh, during these times and a lot of uh, international organizations cooperate. But I would suggest that it is very important to empower the local organizations which uh, protect um, uh, 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 women uh, and uh, who uh, particularly work on the uh, safeguarding of the women's rights. And uh, certainly there should be uh, a lot of money allocated to provide shelter and support to the women who are need at the local level. Um, at the local level. Thank you. Anita, picking up on that point about women's political leadership, there has been a lot written about different responses to, uh, if we look at New Zealand, uh, Germany, that have brought into focus 
sometimes the different attributes that women bring to political leadership that uh, affect policy outcomes. What do you think we've learned about women's political leadership during this time? Uh, indeed, this was uh, also another uh, area. Can I ask, sorry, just ask for Anita, but thank you. No worries. Sure, if she wants to answer. Oh, but, but absolutely jump in if you'd like, an Elena. <laughs> Look. No, no, I thought it was a follow up question. If Okay. Happy. Okay, go ahead. So sorry. Sure. I guess I'll. I'll. Uh, yeah. Um, well, this is this is obviously an area I've done a lot of work. Um, I actually with international ideas, one of the partners, um, and working with Kevin Devoe on that as well through GPBS and uh, UNDP, uh, was managing I know politics, which is a global yeah. network of women in politics. Um, and I I do think that you do see. Um, you know, it, without going to an essentialist view of women, I, I do think you see a difference when you have uh, more women in uh, elected roles. And a lot of that is different lived experiences. And in fact, not just women, but more diversity. Um, like, like any organization, when you have uh, too much homogeneity, people with the same lived experience, same ideas, you won't come up with as many solutions. Um, I think COVID has been particularly hard on women in politics. Uh, even just uh, myself and some of my colleagues and anecdotally, um, the tension that is out there uh, does seem to manifest in uh, violence or, or you know, online or, or, or in person against women in politics, and this has gone up since the pandemic. Um, I also think, though, that women at the table uh, definitely bring a, a different experience. They will bring different issues to the table um, and, and different ways of engaging. And this is absolutely vital. I, I do think having a cabinet with 50% women has significantly made a difference, um, but it also makes a difference in terms of what what younger, you see, a young woman who sees herself reflected. Um, sure. Whether and, and intersectionality as well. You you need to have women with, with who are amongst themselves very different in terms of lived experience. Uh, so I, it does make a difference. Okay. Um, thank you, Anita. Uh, anything to add, Elena? Before we move on. No, no, I just wanted to say that uh, we have also um, particularly emphasized that uh, a woman leaders had the advantage and uh, it was widely also noted that women leaders performed really, really well uh, during the pandemic. Maybe it uh, just gives uh, a reflection to across the world that uh, uh, there should be more engagement of the women at uh, the de decision making level and at top levels that they really managed during, uh, 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 during the crisis uh, pretty well. So. Just the reflection. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Um, Kevin Casazamora, Max Cameron, a professor of political science from UBC, University of British Columbia, has a question for you. Um, the call to defend democracy notes that democracy does not guarantee competent leadership and effective governance. What can we do to improve the quality of leadership in democracies? Do you think elected officials need better training or those aspiring to be? Uh, and uh, support for their preparation uh, to be effective in public service? Uh, sure. I mean, that can that can only that can only help. Uh, so my short answer is, is yes, I mean, the more the more training we provide for aspiring politicians, uh, the better, which I guess which I guess is a is a uh, is a way of saying that in most democracies we have to work more with political parties mm -hmm. uh, because the natural vehicle for that sort of training uh, should be political parties, sure. uh, and then you know we can get into a very complicated discussion about the kind of incentives that different electoral systems and, and different political regimes create. Uh, for political parties to be a uh, permanent institutions rather than electoral machines. <laughs> uh, 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 and I guess that in turn would uh, uh, lead us to the to the question, which is, of course, uh, as, as you alluded uh, in your introduction, your kind introduction, uh, one of my favorite 
issues in the world is campaign finance, you know, and, and, and one of the things that you can do through election subsidy, through a, a, a state funding for, a, for political parties is nurture a more permanent structure able to provide that sort of training a, to aspiring politicians. Mm-hmm. And not just that, a, also the kind of structures that would have resources to enable leaders from vulnerable and marginalized groups to emerge as a force within political parties and eventually within the political system. So the question of money is is of the essence if we want to take uh, seriously the ability of political parties to provide that sort of of training, uh, which I think I I fully agree. We We need more of that. Thank you. Can I linger on that topic of political parties? Because uh, I happen to agree with you that they are a very important institution, but we all recognize, I think, among, uh, if you look at uh, surveys, they rank among the lowest in terms of trust worldwide. Um, And so to my colleagues that have been in elected office um, and have worked on democracy strengthening, what do you say to those that are really worried about getting involved in political uh, in supporting political parties because it's messy um and it can be dysfunctional and it's risky um is it worth the 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 risk to do so and and in doing so what's necessary uh to make sure that uh, it's done in a professional way in a, in a way that manages risk appropriately can i throw that out to, to anita first and then kevin so, uh, so I really appreciate this because I, I think that political parties, uh, certainly today, are looked at with so much skepticism, and yet that is really, if you want to make a difference, uh, it is the way to go about it. When I was in university, and um, if you wanted to be an activist, you joined political parties and you joined different groups. I, I was a member of Amnesty International, the Green Club, the uh, Civil Liberties, and I was president of the local liberal club on campus. And those were not seen as mutually exclusive. Mm -hmm. Uh, You were an activist, you were also in a political party. Now, I especially, um, and maybe this is because of technology, but with a lot of young people, if you are in a political party, you are seen as not being able to be an activist. You are somehow a sellout or you, you know, you're, you're leaving activism and, and it's not, and frankly, we need more activists within the political party. We need people to go back and forth. A lot of the work that I did on gender, um, many of the women who were elected overseas were elected from civil society, from activism, and then they felt when they got into those roles that they lost their constituency because it's a different hat. And I think if we can get, I know that the World Movement for Democracy has a crossover project where they're trying to show stories of women uh, or, or anybody who has trans, transferred from being a human rights defender, a democracy activist into government or, or parliament and then back again. And the understanding of those different roles of the capacities uh, that, that you have within those, uh, I think is incredibly important. And there's a divide today that I have never seen before between the two. And I, I would strongly encourage any projects that encourage people to go into elected politics and then back into activism. Okay. And Kevin, can I ask you then, is this something Canada should do more of? Uh, uh, there are very few um, development agencies that have taken a, a strong role in supporting political party uh, development. Is there room and uh, is there a need for Canada to be more present in that uh, pursuit? Yeah, thank you. Um, um, yeah, I think the, the short answer is yes, but I think it should be done through the political parties. Uh, I've done a review of the Minister Foundation for Democracy, uh, well, it's five years ago now. Um, but we found the strongest, most impactful work that they were doing was through the political parties with a sister to sister approach. And it's because there's a, there's, I remember being in Bosnia and talking with someone from the uh, Social Democratic Party in the federal parliament. And they said, oh, look, our relationship with the Labour Party is such that, you know, we just pick up the phone and we have a conference. There's an immediate trust because we know we're on the same side. There's a brethren there, you know, probably because there's these international organizations like Socialist International or Liberal Democrats, or I forget the one for the 
more conservative parties. But um, so I really think that there is a need for that. But for example, I think Canada is probably one of the only major countries, uh, probably the only G7 country that doesn't have this. Uh, our political parties don't have an international wing. They don't do work internationally. Australia does it. New Zealand is doing it. Uh, most of Europe, uh, obviously the UK and the US, and we don't. And I don't understand particularly why that has been the case. I mean, we can get into the sort of culture of Canada, but I mean, I think that that is something that uh, could be done differently. There needs to be support for that. There needs to be rules and standards. But at the same time, I think there is room for that. The other, just picking up on Anita's point, can I just say as well that um, I, I agree with her that, and I'm also still currently president of a local riding association here. I agree there is that divide in a way that hasn't been in the past. Um, but I think it's also an opportunity, if I can look at it a little more positively, I think we're looking at a probably in the, a moving towards political parties being, being more um, a coalition of those who are concerned about particular agendas or issues for mm -hmm. an election or maybe two elections. So someone may come into a political party and may become a minister or maybe a, an MP um, and will be involved in trying to advance the agenda that maybe is in that manifesto. And maybe in 10 years, they move on and do something else. Uh, maybe 10 years before they were doing something else. They may even been a member of a different political party. I think there's a little more fluidity in the population that I don't think the political parties that often require very strong loyalty. Um, you know, often people will note who left and came in and out of a party and in a, in a very derogatory way. I see Anita nodding so she understands. Um, so I think that we need to look at political parties more as um, a broker of ideas and the coalescing and coalition around ideas that drives a government um and then perhaps that that doesn't give people this sense that they are you know signing you know signing in blood that they're going to be a member for life and i think that that change maybe is necessary as well it, it, tom can i can, can i come in here i mean this is very interesting uh, the last point I, i'm going to strike a slightly contrarian note here uh, and I'll preface that by saying that, you know, I'm a political party uh, kind of guy, right? I mean, I just said a couple of minutes ago that if you want to provide training to politicians, you should, you know, try to do it through political parties and so on and so forth. Well, it, it, it so happens, and I'm pretty sure that this is true about all of us, you know, I've been attending different kinds of meetings where the future of political parties is discussed where and we invariably we all end up saying including myself you know that political parties should be nurtured and strengthened because they're essential for democracy okay that's great i've been doing this tom by now for 25 years repeating that message and we have nothing to show for it. I mean, the, the, the credibility of political parties has never been lower. So, I mean, there's, there, there's some soul searching to do here. A, 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 you know, at some, a, 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 there are times when I, when I just wonder a, if political parties as we know them are creatures of the 20th century and and perhaps we are just uh, flogging a dead horse and that we need to rethink the whole the, the the whole notion of political parties and that's why i like about this notion of being sort of transient coalitions that can drive policy policy agendas that's that's one way to to think about this the other thing that I cannot help but to think is that political parties, I mean, I, I'm here, I'm, I'm, I'll, uh, I guess I'll, I'll talk about the experience in Latin America, which is what I know best. Political parties have been lousy in terms of leveraging a information and communication technologies. And, as, and one of the effects of that is that they have been terrible in, in terms of speaking to young people. 
I mean, if you don't use this, if you don't maximize the possibilities that this gives you in terms of communicating with young people, you're toast. You're toast. And, you know, that's, you know, the thought, I mean, for, I know very few young people that can bear the thought of spending endless hours sitting on, you know, a, a party committee meetings, you know, that's not their thing. Just as the idea of signing up for life to a political party is entirely inimical to their ethos. So this is a, a long winded way of saying that we really have to think systematically in a, in a, in a, in, in a better way that we've done so far about the future of political representation. I don't think we've done enough of that. I don't think political science has done enough of that. Uh, but, you know, the, I guess this is a, a, a warning that simply repeating, we have to strengthen political parties and we have to find ways to attract people to become party members. That's not going to work. I mean, that hasn't worked for as long as I've been in this business for 25 years. You're muted, Tom. I, I see Kevin DeVoe wanted to jump in very quickly. I see we've touched a nerve with political parties. <laughs> no, it's a, it's a very good point because they are at the heart of democracy. Look, I, I agree with uh, the other Kevin. Um, I think that, um, you know, the 20th century parties, you, you think about trade unions, you think about business, they were more rigid. Uh, the 21st century is about networks. And I think I think parties have to adapt. In your example from Latin America, maybe what we saw as a result of that in, the, you know, before COVID was all the protests that were going on in Chile and Ecuador and Peru and other places in the Latin America, because the parties have lost that disconnect with the population. And I think the per percentage of people who are members, at least in Canada, has dropped dramatically in the last 30 years of a political party. And so they need to find, it used to be they had a certain core group that they could rely on. They can't anymore. I think they need to look at it as coalition building and brokering, um, you know, a coalition. And until that changes, I think parties are going to struggle. Okay. Um, Colin, I'd like to ask you, listening to this discussion, uh, clearly uh, more thought needs to be put into this. There is no dispute that parties have and will continue to play an essential role in, in, in democracies. But thinking about Canada's opportunity to contribute to a very important dialogue like this and also the importance of building democratic institutions, is this an opportunity for Canada to demonstrate leadership globally um, as a middle power? Um, is this good for foreign policy to uh, take calculated risks? Because I think we've all said this is a, this is, there is an element of risk in, in, in engaging in this. Is this something Canada should do? Promote democracy. Well, yes, I mean, I think we, we have been, uh, and I'll just say in terms of political parties, 20 years ago, I had a conversation with Frank Fukuyama. I was in Washington, our embassy at the time, and we were discussing exactly what we've been talking about. What should Canada do to help promote democracy? And he made the point that the glue of democracy, in his view, were political parties. And he later wrote two big books on democracy, but if you look and you'll see, he talks about importance of political parties as a kind of brokerage mechanism for ideas, but they were more than movements. And what I worry about the stuff I hear is that Kevin and others say, well, I, there, we see movements. We saw this in the Arab Spring, I think the Macron movement, Boris Johnson leads a movement, Mr. Trump leads a movement, but it's not really a party. I think that the uh, in, in, in our country, we've got a kind of mix, but I think that the, the parties are still the basis of and the kind of work that that we do when find our niche, uh, the work that the Parliamentary Center does. I'm not as pessimistic as uh, as Kevin was about 25 years, because I think it's, you know, democracy, uh, well, it has its origins in ancient Greece. It's, if you look back over history, it's a minority movement. It enjoyed a golden age in a sense after the Second World War and probably peaked uh, 
in 2000. Since then, we've been on the back foot, but it's still, as Churchill said, you know, the worst of all form of government, but all the rest. And I think that this is the COVID crisis is fine again, that there are challenges to democracy, but do we prefer the alternative? I don't think so. So to yeah. go to your question, is there, or does Canada have things that Canada can do? Yes, and I think the kind of thing that Anita was talking about with talking with others, women in defense studies, for example, sure. that's a useful form of, of using a political party to work with others who may be like-minded. And I, I, I think that's the route to go. And I think we just keep uh, beavering away. So to the other Kevin, I'd say, don't lose. Uh, sometimes you get too close to it and you get <laughs> dispirited. But uh, don't lose hope. It's still, we're still doing the right thing. And this kind of session is exactly what we should be doing. And, and it is all about ideas. And for ideas to flourish, democracy is still the blessed forum yeah. to have that kind of debate and discussion with outcomes. Let me just, I see a couple of hands, but can I, can I, can I, can I, can I, can I say something real, really, really quick? I mean, I, I haven't lost any any hope uh, on democracy i think the case for democracy remains remarkably strong mm -hmm. i'm losing faith on political parties specifically which is a different discussion yeah is 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 one that we can we can we can have i mean there's nothing written in the stars about any polit that any political institution it, it should be with us for for eternity you know, there are many institutions that have disappeared, you know, into the uh, into the ash of uh, history. <laughs> so, uh, uh, you know, I, that for all I know, that might well happen to political parties as we know them. But I'm not I'm not betting against democracy as such in any way, quite to the country. Yeah. I'm, I'm actually quite, despite the headwinds that we are facing, I'm actually quite optimistic about it. Good. Anita wanted to jump in before I go to Elena, but Anita, quickly. Yes, thank you. Um, just on political parties, I think one of the issues that we have in Canada is, unlike some other countries, when we do development work, we don't want to be picking the winners and losers. Yeah. And we're very reticent, um, certainly, yeah. uh, you know, development funding to go to political parties or political actors. And I think we need to understand the distinction between nonpartisan and multipartisan. And we could be doing a lot more through multi-partisan channels. Um, I know that when Kevin came to testify at the Foreign Affairs Committee to the question of what Canada can be doing on democracy, uh, there was a very strong report that came out of that that built on a report from 10 years ago that Canada needs to have some form of a democracy institute that can be a clearinghouse for a lot of the ideas for these multi-partisan uh, yep linkages and uh, we actually this was in our in our platform uh, in yeah. 2018 to create the peace order and good government center uh, I'm still very strongly pushing to make sure that happens uh, but I think that if, if there's one thing that we could coalesce behind as democracy promoters in Canada would be to really get that off the ground and include all the political parties in it so that you can have those linkages to other parties, but through an institutionalized uh, center. Good. I'd like, I, I appreciate Elena's thoughts on this as you listen to um, sort of what's happening in Canada or globally with, with respect to parties. What's the situation you've experienced in Georgia uh, as uh, in your democratic transition? How have parties responded to the challenges uh, of more citizen demands and, and frustration oftentimes with their inability to uh, to be responsive? Uh, this is quite, I would say that trends are also quite similar in my country, and uh, it, it's uh, it's also I would say the situation is even more severe in terms of when we talk about political parties. We have an extreme polarization, so we have a government party, Georgian Dream, and we have an opposition, very strong political party from the previous government, and basically uh, both uh, there are extreme um, polarization in regards of every level of the society. And when we are talking the 
uh, it was also mentioned that uh, by uh, different panelists uh, that there is a lack of trust uh, towards the political parties. And uh, I would say that in Georgia, this would be pretty much the case. Uh, and uh, when, we, when we talk about the uh, inclusiveness of the different political parties in the political system, uh, we see that um, uh, political parties really lack uh, the, the uh, trust uh, f from the people. And uh, there is, I also observed that there is a lack and lack uh, connection between the uh, communities uh, and constituencies towards them uh, together, to, uh, together with the political parties. And uh, in our country, we have perceived that uh, it was because of the uh, uh, political system maybe we were having, and uh, it's uh, already uh, for the years we are trying to move uh, to a new uh, uh, to, 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 to parliamentary system and or to fully parliamentary system. And also we have also changed our electoral law to make it more proportional because um, it was uh, advantaging the, uh, the, 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 the system we were having before. It was advantages for the um, uh, government parties. But still, um, I would say that um, the, the process remains uh, uh, still uh, stuck. And uh, when we talk about um, the challenges we, we are facing in Georgia, I would also like to mention that in my country, we do not have this uh, ideological strong basis the parties can, would follow. So uh, when we were talking about uh, somehow empowering political parties that uh, in, in the country like um, uh, I'm come from, uh, with, which is uh, kind of following the, the transition um, uh, democratization process, I would say that uh, strengthening this ideological and uh, uh, basis um, in the countries uh, should be uh, the first thing um, that could be done. I would say this would be easier than uh, for, uh, for for the electorate and for the people to accommodate themselves and to uh, affiliate themselves uh, towards one or another political parties. And uh, if done so, I would say that the process would become more inclusive and also more professional and not rather the populist, which is the case currently in my country. Thank, can I ask you, Elena, just a quick follow-up. Sure. What, what's, what's been your experience with the role of the international community in accompanying Georgia on its democratic transition, providing support for those who want to talk about these issues? Um, and is it something that is still valid? I mean, is there a role for if, if this experience sharing to help um, have good conversations that are that are inspired by the experiences of others. Uh, yes, I would say uh, yes, and uh, even even now it is becoming more and more important. I would say we are in the process of uh, our European integration process, and uh, uh, there is a, a valid, let's say, so there is a still a democratic conditionality, and there are still uh, norms that my country needs to comply uh, because we are so eager to uh, integrate uh, in the European family. And I would say that yes, there is a, a lot of work to be done uh, on this. Uh, um, uh, democratization ad ad agenda. I would say uh, there are um, improvements in many, many areas. I already mentioned they have, we have moved to uh, a fully parliamentary system. We have uh, elaborated a new uh, electoral law, law and which was also part of the um, civil activists and the protests. Uh, and it, it's kind of still the case in my country that uh, all the processes are motivated by, by the process and the pushback from the uh, civil society, but it's still good. It's it shows that there is um, a still democratic process happening. But I would say there is a lot of work to be done. And uh, uh, dear colleagues from, uh, for example, from NDI and IRA are uh, very much engaged uh, in the process of helping with um, working with the local communities, um, also in the decentralization process and uh, on working on the electoral reform. And uh, certainly from the EU's part, there is a lot of um, work to uh, also uh, uh, currently uh, undergoing in terms of supporting the civil society organizations. But I would say this would not uh, lose the relevance. And in the future, uh, there should be uh, more international cooperation happening. And for sure, um, uh, in terms of uh, post-COVID recovery period, I, uh, I, I believe that there will be many areas uh, arising uh, and many challenges that would require the help from the international society. Thank you. Kevin DeVoe. Um, Clearly, in this time, there is urgent need for humanitarian responses, shoring up healthcare systems in countries that are really struggling. 
What's the argument to say, let's not forget about democratic institutions? There's an urgent issue, uh, and, and it's uh, really important for Canada to be there, and, and, it, and it has stepped up internationally. What is the argument to say, let's make democratic institutions a part of this uh, response in the, in the emergency phase, but also uh, to ensure um, a more just, inclusive recovery? Yeah, good question. Uh, look, I think um, everything's about governance. Um, that's the short answer. Uh, we can talk about health systems, and I suspect there will be a lot of money going in. The countries I visit, uh, when I start visiting them again, um, a, a, um, there will be a lot of money being poured now into health systems. We always, they say in politics, you don't fight the last election, or in war, you don't fight the last war. I think in some ways, development has a tendency to focus on what was the issue of the crisis in the past, and until the next one comes along. Um, you know, I remember how many people were talking about youth engagement after the Arab Spring, right? Uh, very good points, but uh, there's a tendency to be retroactive. Um, so I think that all of this, though, ties into governance. You need to have effective, independent oversight. Uh, you know, institutions, parliament, auditor general, um, you know, uh, human rights commissions, uh, electoral commissions, in order to have those robust institutions that allow for, um, you know, the development to actually flourish. You need to have accountability. You need to have transparency. Those are governance issues, you know, and just look south of the border. Um, you know, all these issues around the election, you know, they don't have a federal, oh, they do have a federal electoral commission, but very weak one. Every state, every county in some places is making up their own decisions about how mail-in ballots will occur without mm -hmm. those robust independent institutions. Um, you're ending up, I think, with, and that comes under governance, then all that development money will end up just going in the wrong direction and you'll have a lot of corruption. We see already some of the spending that has been caught. Uh, God only knows how many things haven't been caught during the spending that's been going on. And I mean that globally. I think about a minister in Zimbabwe who was charged with, uh, you know, uh, taking money that was supposed to be procured for uh, personal protective equipment. Um, so there are things out there that need to be uh, done, but it's governance is at the core of all of that. Okay. Um, Kevin Casazamora, we talked a lot about the challenges and the real um, threats we see. What do you feel are the bright spots that you've been uh, confronted with to, to see innovation, uh, perhaps the use of technology or the people mm -hmm. figuring out how to respond and adapt approaches uh, in this time to, uh, and, and those and with, a mo with a notion to say what needs to be supported uh, to, to allow those good things to flourish? There are good news. I mean, and they're, they're the good news at the macro level, which I guess have to do. And here I, I will qualify a little bit what I'm going to say. I mean, it, 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 this is going to be a long process. This is not one crisis, but a cascade of crises that will play out in the course of several years. But we have early successes. Let's put it that way. We have early success at the macro level, which you can see in the, the cases, and they have been alluded to here, of democracies that have proven very able to deal with the pandemic so far without sacrificing a basic tenets of democracy. I mean, you know, the likes of New Zealand, uh, the, the Germany, uh, Taiwan. Uh, I mean, you Canadians might, you know, are often a little bit shy, but it, I would say Canada. I would include Canada in that group. Uh, so there are success, and not few. There are uh, success stories so far, so far. So, I mean, this, this notion, uh, this speaks to the notion that, that this, this, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the countries and people that are insisting on using this, uh, this lens uh, to see this crisis as a kind of a competition between democracies and, and authoritarian systems to see who responds more uh, effectively to this to this crisis. I mean, that's the wrong lens. Yeah. 
that's the wrong lens. I mean, is it, 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 and here I guess I'll, I'll go back, I'll digress and go a little bit a, a, in, into the previous question. I mean, to me, I mean, this is, I, I have to recall the the old uh, Huntingtonian uh, insight that is, this is a case in which a far more important than the kind of government that you have is how much government you have. <laughs> a, 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 so the short answer, I mean, I fully agree with Kevin's answer to your question. It's all about, it's all about governments. It's about state capacity. It's how you build effective institutions to deal with this. Part of it has to do with the question of institutional design. Yeah. Sure. How you build institutions that are able to make decisions and implement decisions mm -hmm. in an effective way. Mm -hmm. So there are success stories at the macro level. And then there's the, 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 the more specific, interesting things that are happening and that very likely will survive the after the pandemic. Uh, mm -hmm. What's happening, for instance, and this is something that we at IDEA are doing a lot of work on, the question of special voting arrangements as a, as a, uh, as a critical tool for all uh, electoral systems. I mean, how we, I mean, we, we, we tend to, uh, uh, you know, be very anxious about participation levels, you know, electoral participation levels and absentees in, 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 in a lot of places. Well, I mean, this pandemic has forced us to think through the question of how we make casting your vote easier mm -hmm. yeah. and how we make uh, available different ways uh, to cast your vote. I mean, ranging from early voting to postal voting to different modalities of electronic voting. That's a discussion that will outlive the pandemic for sure. Sure. For sure. And and, and we are it's seeing very, uh, uh, very good successes when it comes to that. I mean, the case, and here I'm going to mention this, uh, uh, I'm just going to mention this, the, the, the case of South Korea, for instance. They held a, a phenomenally successful elections a few months ago, partly because they were able to, uh, to make available different ways to, to exercise uh, uh, your, your voting rights. But also, the, in terms of innovation, and, and, and you guys know more about this than anybody else, I mean, the, all the innovations that we're seeing happening a, in parliaments around the world, yeah. a, from a, introducing a, a virtual sessions in countries like by constitutional amendment in countries like Chile or Singapore, to uh, creating different uses for technology for digital technologies to enhance the communication between parliament and and society. I mean, all those things that were sorely needed before the pandemic yeah. uh, will outlive the pandemic. So we are seeing very interesting things uh, uh, happening, uh, mostly around the use of, of digital technologies. Okay. Kevin, I see your hand up and please jump in. And I wanted to follow up with uh, another question after. Go ahead. Yeah, sorry, just on that point, it's something that there's, there's an intersection going on. We have technology, obviously, as a dominant driver of, and it will under COVID because of social distancing, but I think it will be a trend that will continue. Technology will be a major driver of potentially conflict, as we're seeing in some countries, but also potentially, you know, coalitions. Um, we also have the desire for more inclusivity. How do we get voices from women in marginalized groups more engaged? Um, and then, uh, so one of the things that I've been sort of picking up on, though, is and picking up on Kevin's point. Um, there's been a move to in parliaments to create more opportunity for all MPs to be able, perhaps, to work virtually. We see that because of COVID. Um, and some are saying, why don't we do this permanently? And I've been a voice, maybe sometimes a lonely voice, saying we have to be careful about that. 
because um, we want to have more voices and we want to have, we need more flexibility. We need more family friendly parliaments. But I worry that some, um, those who choose to spend more time in their constituency away from the capital because they see the opportunity to work virtually while working at home in constituencies, I worry that their voices then will become a second tier voice. They're not in the room. They're not the people who are making those decisions. It's ambitious. Let's be frank, mostly, you know, younger, maybe male members, not always, but that are going to be the ones that are going to have the opportunity to fly to the Capitol and be in the room making decisions. And I worry that uh, virtual proceedings, uh, there's a need to engage people virtually. I agree. But the actual MPs need to be in a room. They need to, it's those conversations they have. Uh, informally that make a difference. And if we promote this as a permanent solution, I worry about what that will do, particularly to women MPs, but also those perhaps from certain communities. So I just wanted to point that out. Thank you. I see Anita with a thumbs up. I did, uh, Anita, can I ask you, um, clearly the work be that we do as international uh, democracy supporters and, and in engaging with people in very different systems with different cultures, different histories, this is not about exporting models, it's about a sharing of experiences. But that being said, is there, uh, what is it about Canada that is worth sharing um, in terms of what you've been exposed to around the world and when you, and now that you, um, all the work you did before you were a legislator and now that you are a legislator, what are those experiences that Canada gets right that ought to be shared more? Well, first of all, I think we have struggled with many of the same issues as a country throughout our history and today that a lot of other countries are facing. Um, mm -hmm. And it, it, it's, I mean, we, you know, we are a country that we we have the indigenous populations. We have uh, two bounding, I guess, languages and cultures. We have you know, a lot of immigration, we have constitutional issues, we have you know, so many of the things that, that countries are struggling with. Um, Canadians, I find that, uh, for instance, unlike Europeans, um, instead of codifying everything, uh, certainly in international work, I've noticed that a Canadian will go in and say, you know, what do you all think? Okay, you think this, you, well, if we all agree, let's just do it. And instead of feeling like it always has to be um, written down and formalized. Um, it's it's more practical, and I think that also comes from our history of engaging different groups and trying to be inclusive. And Canada tries very hard, um, but I but I also think that it is it's a style thing. It's it's we don't go in with a you know we know best colonial kind of attitude. We go in very much you know, Canadians who are doing this kind of work um, with a let's learn from each other. And I can tell you that I've learned as much in, my, in the way that I do politics from the work I've done in other parts of the world in Africa and elsewhere, um, even the weekly coffee hours that I do. Uh, and I'm one of the few MPs that does it the way that I do it, where it's the same place, same time, uh, anybody can come. Now it's of course on Zoom, um, <laughs> but from women in Africa. And when I was in the Congo, when I was in other parts of Africa working, uh, doing democracy work, the women in particular had very limited public space available to them to campaign. And the one space they had was the Saturday market. And they were making use of that Saturday market to be able to, to campaign, to be accessible. And when I started, when I decided to run, I thought, well, too bad we don't have Saturday markets. And then I thought, yes, we do. We have shopping. Sure. So I sat at a Tim Hortons at a local mall <laughs> every Saturday, and this is something I have now carried throughout three campaigns. And as an MP, I never miss a Friday. I've moved it onto Zoom. But that engagement, those ideas, um, we don't go in with the attitude of we have it right. We're going to come and teach you how to do it. Uh, we very much Canadians go in with let's work together and solve the problem together. Um, it is very different, and that's why I think we need to be doing more of it. Uh, and really be a bit of a clearinghouse internationally for some of those best practices. Interesting. Colin Robertson, um, obviously you maintain a pretty strong network internationally of, of people like that, such as yourself that have devoted their lives to foreign policy issues. What does the work from Canada regarding this issue? Uh, in terms of democracy? Yeah. Leadership uh, on democracy. Yeah, I, I think that, you know, as Anita said, uh, I think that Canada does bring something special. I think it's a, f a function of 
of both geography and climate. Uh, unlike, say, the Americans who could just send in the cavalry, we, we weren't able to do that. We're too small a country and we're too diverse a country. So I think that that really has made us practice and practical. And so I think those are two great virtues, which make us also pretty good at diplomacy. But in terms of what we actually do well, uh, I think I would list uh, managing elections. I think, again, in contrast to others, we do that really well. And, and that's something we can take abroad. I think the uh, management of diversity, because of the, you know, the fact that half the people in Toronto, our biggest city, were born outside the country. When I tell that to others, they're always kind of astounded. Said, well, how does this work? Well, I say that's why the Agat Can set up his Center for Pluralism in Canada. It's why when Nelson Mandela came to Canada, said, you know, you get it right. And certainly my observation when I go abroad is that that's something we do pretty well. Uh, I realize policing is now under uh, cloud everywhere, but I think we do policing reasonably well, in part because a lot of our police have different languages. So we can go down to a place like Haiti and, and be useful. And that's a vital piece. We you know the outset, we listed some of the vital pieces. Judiciary, I think that that's something we do reasonably well. Uh, after the, the sort of the velvet revolutions in Eastern Europe, we had a program of, of, uh, of, of teaching how to introduce bring in an independent judiciary. And I, years later, I ran into people who'd taken this course who were judges, and they said, you know, I learned this not from the Brits, not from the Germans, not from the French, not from the Americans, but from you Canadians. So I think there are a number of niches that we do really well, uh, managing federations, for example, so you have the federate, but that's what we should be focusing on. I don't think we do it all. I think we, we pick a niche and we pick the places. The place I'd pick today would be Hong Kong, where we have real interest, too, because I think we also have to be interest driven. There's uh, at least 300,000, perhaps half a million Canadians there. Uh, they were to have an election. They didn't have it because it got cancelled. Well, if we can do an election, as you point out, in Korea, but we also just did an election in, in our country, in Brunswick, and it had a higher turnout. So I think we should be working in places where we have interests and where we can bring something. And I would, I, again, I come back to Hong Kong because uh, we've got... It's it's a it's a significant a small piece of our population. I think there's going to be problems there, and if we don't, if things don't go right, the, the, we're going to have a, a major influx at some point from Hong Kong. People wanting to return, and those who with uh, have relationships with Hong Kong that are going to want to come to Canada. So we, we do this for good reasons, but we also do these things out of interest. Elena, listening to this, obviously not a Canadian. What's your sense? Do you think, based on what you know about Canada, what we've talked about today, it, you know, is there a role for a larger presence for Canada in this sector? For sure, I would definitely start with that there is already, and I think that uh, it's kind of uh, uh, this country is really pioneering um, in, uh, in democracy support, and there are a lot of things uh, to be learned from this country, how uh, both from the internal governance or the uh, already engagement of the international scene in the uh, in the democracy support. And um, uh, first of all, what you what I really liked, and Anita also mentioned that uh, this very Canadian approach of um, having. Uh, a collaborative um, approach and not to bringing just the uh, best um, uh, knowledge out of it. And I think that this is really something, a distinctive approach that uh, Canada could bring uh, to international uh, scene and uh, also in the uh, democracy support. Because what we have witnessed that sometimes the, um, uh, this knowledge international organizations or policies which are uh, tailor-made to different, which are uh, developed uh, are not tailor-made to different countries and the context. So I would really uh, think that uh, bringing this, what um, Anita has mentioned, that this collaborative approach of um, uh, uh, the, uh, share, uh, experience sharing and knowledge that would, uh, would really help best uh, to uh, think and develop the strategies that uh, could work um, best uh, for the specific countries and the specific uh, regions, because uh, we have already discussed that um, in the context and tradition different countries really really differ and uh, as as a woman myself I, I would say that uh, yeah for sure having this feminist foreign policy and uh, having a, a special focus on this I think this a lot of countries uh, and also democracy support organizations could uh, have learned um, uh, on this and uh, I would really uh, support of um, having more focus um, 
uh, on this uh, and uh, specifically uh, um, taking uh, the Canadian approach would, uh, would benefit not only uh, just um, the mainstreaming of the women's engagement uh, in uh, politics, but I really believe that uh, there could be a better solutions and uh, uh, policy makers if uh, there are more women engagement in real life. Uh, Tom, can I, can, I, can I say something? Can I come in? Yeah. For one minute, Kevin, go ahead. Uh, I mean, I, I seriously, this is this has been such a wonderful conversation because, I mean, to, to this last point, uh, of course you should do more. I mean, it, 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 people are willing to listen to you guys. I mean, in that respect, you're not terribly unlike the Nordics. You know, I'm doing this interview from Sweden. <laughs> and when 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 you talk about democratic practices, democratic norms, democratic principles, people are more willing to listen to you. I mean, you don't have an imperial past, so the countries, you don't carry with you the baggage that comes with being a superpower. Yeah. And this is something that I I uh, I experienced uh, very closely when, when I when I was at the OAS. I mean, Canada is a very important presence, it, but it's a very constructive uh, actor there. And sometimes, to tell you the truth, I I, I was wishing that uh, Canadians were more assertive uh, in many ways. I mean, you, you guys are too modest and and too respectful, which is which is great. It's one of the reasons why people listen to you. But the other thing that is wonderful about the experience that you bring to the table when you talk about this 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 issues is that in so many ways uh, you combine a uh, strands of the of the american experience and strands of the european experience and 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 that everything else in between <laughs> and that I mean, you you sort of uh, your institutional setup in many ways reflects that, yeah. and that's very unique. Yeah. That's very unique. So I mean, you, you have so much to offer, you know, when it comes to this, and and the most important thing is that that people are, in my experience, really willing to listen uh, to what you guys have to say, uh, particularly in the way you say it. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Kevin. Listen, um, I could go, I think we could go on, um, but I, I just want to briefly reflect certainly on, on, on what I heard. I want to thank the panelists for being so open and, and interacting with each other. Uh, it shows me that this dialogue needs to continue. Um, it, need, it shows me that we don't have all the answers. Uh, we need to do more research, but we need to do as, as, we, as we do that research. Um, we, you know, this is a country where 25% of, of uh, MPs uh, in our parliament are born outside of Canada. There's something unique about this place that's worth sharing. Um, it, the feminist international assistance policy was mentioned as something that gets noticed in the world, and it's something people want to learn more about. Uh, uh, GBA plus, uh, the way Canada looks at policies on how they um, how they affect different communities and looking at intersectionality issues. I think there's, it, it, it certainly um, makes a strong case for Canada to um, do more uh, in an organized way. Anita mentioned the, set, the Canadian Center for Peace, Order and Good Government. We are full supporters of that and want to do all we can to dialogue about how, it's, how it could be structured. There's lots of examples in the world to look at, but I think to have a platform where we could really take a leadership position in the role in the world could really be a good thing. Um, I um, and also I think the modesty issue um, is an interesting one. And, and those of us that have worked in democracy support around the world, us Canadians, have often done so in the service of other countries. And it would be great if we could do so um, from home, but also with the colleagues we've met from Croatia, from uh, Afghanistan, from Korea, from all these different places. Um, so I do want to thank you for your contributions, for your thoughts, and I want to thank the the uh, audience as well for the, the questions that I saw rolling through and the, and the answers that were given by our panelists. So thank you so much, uh, merci beaucoup, and uh, to the next time. Happy Democracy Day. Thank you so thank much. You. Bye bye. Thank bye. you. Goodbye.